in the grim darkness of the far future, there is only war, she said in her pink fuzzy cardigan. <laughs> Howdy, y'all. I'm Rissy, and I review things. Last time, I reviewed a book that dealt with the importance of hope, even in the middle of an apocalypse. Today, I'll tackle a book with a very different approach to the same topic. The book in question is Horus Rising, the first book in a series called The Horus Heresy. This is a series of novels presented as background for the Warhammer 40k tabletop miniatures game, which is a game where different groups of monstrous people fight each other in space! These books are prequels to the game, taking place roughly 10,000 years before the events of the actual miniatures game are supposed to happen. Will they end up like the Star Wars prequels and totally suck? Well, <laughs> strap yourselves in, y'all, because this is gonna be one hell of a ride and a whole lot of fun. But first, I must have a face as bare as the desiccated oceans of old Terra. So in order to explain this book, I have to explain the history of the game that it's based on. But don't worry, this won't be like a boring expo dump because it's some of the most like fucking hilarious, absolutely bonkers shit I have ever heard and spoiler alert, I fucking love it. Uh, I mean, the lore. I'm not really into miniature based wargaming except for when it's used as a supplement for Dungeons and Dragons. So the game. Warhammer 40k began back in 1987. It's created by a company called Games Workshop, and it takes place in the 41st millennium, hence the 40k. The premise is that in the 41st millennium, humankind has taken to the stars. We're based out of old Earth, but we're expanding out through the galaxy, and everything out there is really really fucking hostile to human life. In fact, everything is so hostile to human life that the only way for humans to actually survive in this galaxy is a kind of forever war sort of scenario. In fact, that's the tagline for the game is that in the grim darkness of the far future, there is only war. That's right. This game is literally the origin of the term grimdark. There's some fun trivia. This is a total crap sack world. Well, I guess crap sack galaxy would be a more accurate term. In the miniatures game, you can play one of several different factions. So you've got humans who are the Imperium of Man, and then you have space elves, which come in two flavors, assholes and evil assholes. You can play necrons, which are evil undead robot mummies, and you can play the triffids, fucking tyranids, it's tyranids, who are evil robots that eat all life force. And then there, I think there's the Tau, which are some kind of alien that has mind control powers. But the setup of the game has always been that it's humans who are kind of the nominal good guy faction, probably because the makers of the games were like, well, people could probably relate the best to humans, <laughs> um, as opposed to undead robot mummies. So they're the good guys. And when I say good guys, I mean only by comparison to everybody else. The galaxy in the 41st millennium is in such a shitty state that the Imperium of Man is basically a religious fundamentalist carnival of horrors run by theocratic space Nazis. And they're the good guys. That's how bad everything else in the galaxy actually is. And so what you do is you buy like these miniatures, you make yourself an army, and then you fight other people's armies. Oh, and one of the other factions is the forces of chaos. Chaos in this game is a lot like, if you've ever read any of the works of H.P. Lovecraft, the sort of eldritch horrors beyond the stars. That's what chaos is. It's like these ancient gods that rule over a primordial force that is inherently corrupting to anything that it touches. It brings madness and decay. It's also the source, though, of psychic powers and things like that. In the future, humans have psychic powers, or a lot of them do. Not that that's really much of a compensation <laughs> um, for the whole everything being a crap sack, but hey, psychic powers! And the forces of chaos live in a place called the Warp, which is like 
like a part of space, but not like physical space. Like you can get there physically, but it exists outside of that. And that's where all this horrible bad shit lives. And I mean, they're really terrible. There's four gods of chaos. There's corn. <laughs> Okay, so here's the thing that I love, I love it so much about Warhammer, is that the names are ludicrous. I They're they're so awesome. So it's Korn, it's spelled K-H-O-R-N-E, and he is the god of strife and warfare and bloodshed. So if you've ever heard the phrase blood for the blood god, that's Korn's thing. There's a guy named Zinch who is the architect of fate, and he's always plotting and scheming and committing fell acts of sorcery and whatnot. There's Slanesh, who is an androgynous sex monster, the god of sensation in all of its forms, but especially monster sex stuff. And then finally there's Nurgle, which again, what the fuck? Nurgle? How can you be afraid of somebody who's like, Nurgle? I assume that they were riffing off of the ancient Babylonian god of plague, Nergal, but there's a big difference between Nergal and Nurgle. I'm Nurgle, I'm the god of decay. Nurgle, Nurgle, Nurgle. There's chaos versions of humans. They're all like gross and corrupted and super into weird sex shit. And that's where the evil elves come from too, is they've been infected by the forces of chaos. And chaos just, it makes you crazy and it makes you gross. Unfortunately, if you are a psychic in this world, it's really hard to avoid chaos. You have to be like, CONSTANT VIGILANCE! So how are humans gonna survive in this horrifying galaxy full of things that want to like eat, rape, and otherwise destroy you? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. For humans, it's one of those best defense is a good offense kind of thing. The Imperium of Man is like the last best hope. It rules a lot of the galaxy and is run by, well, theocratic space Nazis, but specifically, the Imperium of Man is run by a religious cult of its emperor, who is the God King, referred to as the Emperor of All Mankind. Here's a special detail about the Emperor of All Mankind. He is a moldering corpse <laughs> who sits in a gigantic golden throne. The throne has to be gigantic because in life he was like fucking 10 feet tall. However, he's not just a corpse that's religiously venerated. He's a psychically powerful corpse. He does a lot of maintenance of the Empire's ability to travel through space. In order to get around space at faster than light speeds, you have to go through the warp, where like all the chaos gods live. The Emperor is such a powerful psychic that with his will alone, he can keep the forces of chaos from destroying Earth, Old Earth, which is generally referred to as Terra, and allow passage through space for humans. That doesn't mean they're completely immune to chaos attacks, but it does help. When I say he's psychically active, he doesn't talk to people. You can pray all you want to him, but he's gonna just straight up ignore you with only like two very notable exceptions. He's just kind of quietly doing his thing to maintain the space travel capacity of the Empire while his body rots. The religious cult based around him is imagine the absolute worst excesses of the Catholic Church church during the medieval era in Europe and crank that up to 11 and that's where you start with this. Any kind of, if you try to make technology that didn't exist during the Emperor's living days, you will be branded a heretic and purged, and I mean murdered, with fire. If you do anything that doesn't exactly jive with what the religious authorities have determined is proper veneration of the Emperor, you will be purged. You see what I mean about the fucking theocratic space Nazis? But also, it's not just that there's a church that venerates the emperor. My version of holy water, of course, is MacFix Plus. There is an order of warrior monks, I guess you could say. Warrior monks dedicated to the emperor and the preservation of his empire. Sort of a cross between warrior monks and like knights templars. And they are the space marines. So the space marines are the most popular faction that you can play in the game. I should note that their actual name is the Adeptus Astartes. <laughs> One of the things that the people who made this game love is massacring Latin. I don't know if any of them actually have any kind of formal training in Latin, but they sure do love fucking it up. So the Adeptus Testartes, or Space Marines, they're Marines in space, only they're not just any old kind of, of Marine. They're not just like human soldiers. They come from humans, but they are beyond human. I guess you could say transhuman. Because they're all seven to eight feet tall 
and they are massively over muscled and they don't have ribs. They have armor plating in place of ribs. They have two hearts. They're like Klingons, only even more so. There's also like a regular Imperial army made out of humans, but that's not what we're focusing on today. We're focusing on the Space Marines because that is the main subject of our stories. There's like regular human-ish Space Marines and then there's Chaos Space Marines who've been corrupted by chaos. Now the Empire used to rule a huge chunk of the galaxy and all the Space Marines used to be united in their cause of conquering the galaxy for the Empire and protecting, well, supposedly, protecting the people that live in it. But now some of them are into chaos and that means they're gross rotting sex monsters who are locked in a forever war with all these other alien factions. Which is perfect for a fucking miniatures game, right? You need there to be an eternal war going on so that you'll never have a reason to stop making miniatures and people will never have a reason to stop playing them. If there was no war, there'd be no game. I've barely touched on this, but like the world of the Imperium of Man is not a fun place to be for just about anybody. The Space Marines come from human beings that are taken from like gangs or really terrible circumstances in life and they're subjected to all this crazy genetic and surgical modifications. Most of them die during this process and if they don't die then there's all this post-hypnotic suggestive shit that turns them into super loyal super soldiers. They don't get to lead normal lives. It's not great for really anybody else. The whole thing is a kind of neo-feudal system, so there's noble families, but most people aren't noble families. Most people are born and, and live out their existences in hive worlds, where it's just like nature's not really a thing anymore. It's just giant buildings full of people covering a whole planet. I hope I've managed to convey just how much everything fucking sucks in the 41st millennium. Oh, and the Emperor's moldering corpse. Let's say you're a powerful psychic and you work for the Empire, there's a pretty high chance that you're just going to be sacrificed to keep the Emperor alive, quote unquote. A thousand psychics every day have to be sacrificed to keep that motherfucker on his throne. Of course, if he's not on his throne, then chaos can destroy the Empire and you won't be able to travel through space anymore, but you know, whatever. This is like the ultimate crap sack grim dark world. Where do the books come in, you might ask, because it's been a while and I haven't yet brought that up. So you've got this corpse on a golden throne, you've got this horrifying set of enemies ready to destroy humanity at any moment, and this terrifying religious cult, and you might ask yourself, well, how did I get here? Well, what separates, say, Warhammer 40k from a game like Battleship, which is functionally the same thing, is that there's a lot of what is uh, called fluff by the fans, which is lore that explains how things got to be the way they are. How did the galaxy end up as such a horrifying fucking crap sack? Well, one of the things we learn in the lore is that it didn't always used to be this way. At one point in time, the Empire was truly glorious. It had expanded over to most of the galaxy. The Emperor was a living human-ish being. There weren't any such things as Chaos Marines. In general, things were a lot better. Well, what the fuck happened? How did we get from glorious spacefaring Empire to the grim darkness of the far future? Well, to answer that question, we have to go back to the 31st millennium. Yeah, that's right. This shit has been happening for 10,000 years. I should start maybe by explaining the Emperor, because the Emperor of Mankind is kind of what all this hinges around. And to sum up, the Emperor is a very, very powerful psychic, as I've already said, but he's also something called a Perpetual. Ostensibly, he was born from human parents, but a Perpetual is somebody who is immortal. Unless they are killed, they cannot die. And in the Perpetual's case, even if you kill them, they will keep coming back, or that's the idea. There's a couple of other Perpetuals in the books. So the Emperor is immortal. He's been around for a while. He is supposedly a genius, but we'll get to that. He does know how to like do a bunch of stuff with genetic engineering, a bunch of stuff with magic, sorcery, psychic powers, all of which of course involve the warp, but he's not been corrupted by the warp because he's so powerful. Before the 31st millennium, the Earth had gone through a lot of catastrophic fuck-ups. All the oceans had been dried up, there was horrible climate change shit, and there'd been so much war that nearly everything had been destroyed, and the Emperor managed to unite the entire planet underneath him. So he comes out of nowhere, well, by nowhere I mean Anatolia, apparently, is where he was born, 
he conquers first the whole planet, and then he decides that we need to make the galaxy safe for human beings. So he wants to start what's called the Great Crusade, which is where humanity goes out into the galaxy and starts colonizing worlds, but also starts destroying, first of all, the forces of chaos, but also any hostile alien life. But to run his Great Crusade, he's going to need generals, and you can't have just fucking normal human generals and a normal human army. So the Emperor creates the Primarchs, and the Primarchs are his large adult sons. I say that because he doesn't get women pregnant, thank fucking god, because there's no uh, women out there that are his size, and one wonders, like, how his family reacted to him being like, oh, I guess our son is fucking ten feet tall, whatever. He takes his own genetic material, and he fucks with it some, and creates the Primarch. They're not just transhuman, they're basically demigods. If the Emperor is powerful enough to be considered a god, his sons are not too far behind him in terms of power. They're all like nine and a half to ten feet tall, and they're the creations of his genetic engineering, which creates their gene seed, <laughs> which is what makes them special. He decides he's gonna make the generals of his great crusade the Primarchs. He creates them in a lab, and they're gestating in their tubes when the forces of chaos attack and scatter all of the infant Primarchs to the four winds of the galaxy, and their tubes end up on very different planets. And some of these planets are serious crap sacks, and some of these planets are kind of okay. The baby Primarchs grow up super fast, and most of them, no matter how shitty the planet is, manage to kind of conquer everything. Eventually the Emperor figures out where all of them are, and as part of the beginning stages of his Great Crusade, he goes out to find them, his lost sons. Because we're doing kind of a grimdark thing today, I decided I would try and make as dark an eyeshadow look as I can really do, and also have it be kind of springtimey, so we'll we'll just see where this goes. A full goth look is really hard for me to pull off and still look human, because my eyes are very deep set, and so if I put dark eyeshadow all over my eyes, it will make them truly cadaverous. So again, we'll we'll see what I can do. So the Emperor is out there in the galaxy finding his large adult son. I love the idea of various people on different planets finding this kind of Superman-style baby pod, and they're like, oh, it's a baby, let's adopt it! They start raising this thing, and apparently they reach full size in three years. It's not like they have a super long time to develop, but in that time you go from, like, baby to ten foot tall demigod, and I just have this, um, <laughs> this vision in my mind of one parent is like, what the fuck is going on? Our baby is ten feet tall. And the other parent is completely fucking clueless and is like, that's my strapping lad! Oh, he's so big, he needs more food! Sometimes it's the male parent that's like that, and then sometimes it's the female parent, if there is one, and she's just an Italian grandmother who's like, oh, you're too skinny, you need to eat, mangi, mangi! And each large adult son, as it turns out, is destined to have his own large adult sons. And those are the Space Marines. So the Emperor has crafted a legion of Space Marines for each Primarch, and he did it with their gene seed. <laughs> It's, I'm sorry, it's never not funny. Yeah, I'm a 12 year old, what do you want? So they're all like fucking seven and a half to eight feet tall, so you've got the Emperor, his large adult sons, and their large adult sons. The gene seed transplantation has the effect of making them, in a lot of ways, mentally and physically like the Primarch who they originate from. The Emperor finds each son and gifts them their legion of their own large adult sons. Once that's accomplished with all of them, it's time to begin the Great Crusade. Right? And so they start off attacking orcs. Oh yeah, I totally forgot, they're space orcs. And the Great Crusade, it goes swimmingly at first. They conquer the space orcs and pretty much just totally curb stomp everything that might get in the way of the Imperium of Man. Oh, originally there were supposed to be 20 Primarchs, but two of them were apparently destroyed at some point along with their legions maybe, because they, they did something bad or something was wrong with their gene seed. <laughs> um, and for whatever reason, there's only 18 legions, even though one of them is run by a pair of twins. Most people don't know that they're twins. We're gonna get into that. The Great Crusade is going incredibly well. What could possibly go wrong? What could harsh the Emperor's vibe at this point. Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> the main problem is the Emperor is a fucking idiot. He might be a master of genetic engineering, but he has no idea how to deal with the conditions of the human heart. 
And that's what fucks everything up, isn't it always? The Emperor is basically the worst single dad ever. He generally is a pretty neglectful father. Unless, of course, you're one of his favorites, and he plays really heavy favorites. Daddy loves a winner, and only a winner. And this, plus his habit of just not telling people what the fuck he's doing, is what dooms the Imperium of Man to the grim darkness of the far future. So as part of the Great Crusade, the Emperor has a side project that he's working on back on Terra, and he decides after some initial victories that it's time to pass the fighting part of the Crusade off to his favorite son, Horus. Now, Horus is at this point, generally speaking, considered a good guy. A good guy who's part of a crusade to wipe out lots and lots of other sentient species, but let's overlook that for now. <laughs> All of his brother Primarchs generally really like him. He's extremely charismatic. He's charming. He's intellectual and sensitive, but also a peerless warrior. And so he's a natural choice to take over the Great Crusade. And so the Emperor appoints him the War Master and fucks off back to Terra. He also doesn't tell Horus why he's going back to Terra. And this really plagues Horus with doubt. When you combine that with the fact that a bunch of his brother Primarchs start fomenting dissent and plotting and scheming to achieve their own agendas, eventually Horus goes kind of bonkers and is contaminated by the forces of chaos. He gets a vision of the 41st millennium, and he sees that the Emperor has become this figure of religious veneration. And previously, the Emperor's like, I'm not a god. Nobody's allowed to worship me. I may be, like, more than a regular human, but I came from regular humans. My large adult sons also come from human stock, as do the Space Marines. So no worshipping of anybody is allowed. The early version of the Empire is a completely secular state. Horus sees this vision where everything is a complete and total crap sack and the Emperor is being venerated like a god and in fact has entire planets that are just like one big church basically and he's like, oh fuck, clearly the Emperor is abandoning the Great Crusade to focus on obtaining godhood. I have to stop this. And he rebels. He starts what is called the Horus Heresy. And he brings exactly half of his brothers with him. All of this has been known in the lore for years. Pretty much as long as the game has existed, there's been this background. You knew point A to point B, but not all the fine details. This is where it gets explained. Oh, I should mention, this is part of a series of like 55 books at this point. They're structured kind of like a series of Greek tragedies as part of one big tragedy. We know how this story ends, but how exactly did we get there? What was Horus actually like? What were the Space Marines doing? How did this affect the lives of regular people? That's these books. And I think it's a really great concept. That's part of why I was so interested. One of the things they focus on is the Primarchs themselves, because I was fascinated, like, wow, what's the deal with these giant demigods, these fucking titans? Especially once I learned all of their ridiculous and completely stupid names. <laughs> I don't know who is responsible for doing this, but their names are so stupid for the most part, it boggles the mind. It is, however, important to keep in mind that these books are basically like a novelization for a line of toys. Do you know how back in the 80s, all of these cartoons that a lot of us loved so much were literally just created to sell toys? Well, these books are basically the same thing. They're just filling in the background for a bunch of toys for grown-ups. Of course they were gonna be kind of silly, and of course the names of the characters were decided before the whole backstory was completely fleshed out. So all the bad guy characters are gonna have bad guy names, even though they weren't born bad guys, at least not most of them. The game started in the 41st millennium with the established Chaos Marines versus the Imperium Marines. The good guy Primarchs are not immune to having really stupid names. Their names are just not, you know, obviously names for evil people. How do you get a, a good guy character whose name is Reboot Guliman? Yeah, that is the name of the dude who runs the Ultramarines. <laughs> um, and what the fuck? Uh, what the fuck? One of my favorites is a Primarch named Angron. He's a bad guy. Can you guess what his most salient personality trait is? If you guess that he is angry, you would be correct. He's described as 
red and angry constantly and I'm like just turning red like like a cartoon like does he have smoke coming out of his ears too and what's even better is that so Angron is angry well there's a another one of the bad guy Primarchs named Perturabo who's most salient quality is that he's a pissy bitch and nobody likes him because of that. So Angeron is angry, Perturabo is just perturbed. Some of the names actually do make sense in a fantasy context. Names like Rogel Dorn, okay, that's a pretty solid fantasy name, cool. Then you have names like Corvus Corax. Yeah, one of the Primarchs has literally just got the scientific name for the common North American raven. His legion is called the Raven Guard. What a surprise. There's Conrad Kurz, who is a total batshit violent terrorist maniac, and of course his name is a reference to the character from Heart of Darkness. The twins are supposedly one person named Alpharius Omegon, <laughs> but it's actually like Alpharius is one of them and Omegon is the other, and they're identical and they really like fucking with people. They have Alpha Legion and their whole existence is to basically just fuck up other people's shit constantly. Some of the names are definitely more of like a kind of gothy sort of thing, which is very appropriate. There's Sanguinius, who is... how to explain? Okay, my only guess as to the creation of Sanguinius is that for a while Games Workshop was run by a bunch of 16-year-old anime fans, because Sanguinius is a 10-foot-tall, beautiful, gorgeous, blonde hunk of man, and he's an angel, like he has literal wings. None of the other Primarchs have fucking wings, okay? It's just him. The Emperor was like, well, I guess I gotta have one of my kids have wings. And he's a vampire! <laughs> and his legion is the Blood Angels. You have Mortarian, his legion is called the Death Guard, and he becomes a really gross servant of Nurgle. But again, who would have named him Mortarian to begin with? And um, the stupidest name I have ever heard in my life, I've read some very, very bad fantasy, my friends, and I have never come across anything as terrible as the name of this one Primarch, Lionel Johnson. Now, you might think, Rizzy, that's not so bad. It's a little incongruous for a fantasy setting, right? Where you've got characters like Rogel Dorn and Sanguinius and then just a regular Lionel Johnson. What a completely ordinary last name. But his name is not Lionel. His name is Lion L apostrophe Johnson. Lion L Johnson. What is that shit? Apparently, on the planet he landed on, where he was basically raised by wolves, all of the local people started calling him Lion L. Johnson, which means in their language, Lion, son of the forest. So there is a planet where people speak a language where Lion means the same thing in that it does in English, L means son of, and Johnson means forest. <laughs> All of these magnificent green Johnsons out there. <laughs> I wonder if it was just a spelling thing, if his name was supposed to be Lionel Johnson, but then somebody was like, I put an apostrophe in there, huh? And then they had to explain that, because my god, it's so stupid. I love it so much. And then his legion is the Dark Angels. That's another thing, like the naming of the legions. I don't know if they had it done by several people who weren't communicating with each other, but you've got the Dark Angels and the Blood Angels. You've got the Sons of Horus, the Thousand Sons, and the Emperor's Children. You've got the Space Wolves and the Luna Wolves at one point. You have the Iron Hands. You have the Imperial Fists. There's a lot of fucking overlap is what I'm saying here. Oh, the guy who runs the Iron Hands is a dude named Ferris Manus. <laughs> which is Latin for Iron Hands. <laughs> I think his ship is also called the Hand of Iron. <laughs> it's like one of those 80s groups where like the band name and the name of their album are the same name and then they have like their one hit song also has the same name. The authors of these books kind of have a Herculean task ahead of them. They have to take a line of toys and make this into something that might be kind of good. Now, Evaluating tie-in fiction requires a special sort of attitude. I never assumed that the Warhammer tie-in novels were going to be like something by Nabokov or Dostoevsky or Toni Morrison, okay? You have to be able to appreciate a thing for what it is. Are these gonna be semi-decent? 
science fantasy slash horror books? Or are they gonna end up like the Star Wars prequels trying to tell a tragic story of a fall from grace and just completely fuck it up? You have to make the Primarchs seem like real people. And you have to do the same thing for the Space Marines too. And by the way, they're seven foot tall hulking monstrosities. The Space Marines and the Primarchs, they have power armor that they're wearing and it's just gigantic and heavily stylized, which obviously looks cool with the miniatures. But then you realize what it looks like on a person if they take their helmet off, they have itty bitty heads and these gigantic bodies. So, is this fucking book any good? And the answer is yes! I really liked this book! I surprised even myself. It is what it is, right? This is not literature. But for what it is, it's extremely enjoyable. It manages to tell the story of the beginning of the Horus Heresy with a very view from the cheap seats kind of thing. So our main character is a dude named Garviel Loken, who is a space marine in the Luna Wolves. The Luna Wolves go on to become renamed the Sons of Horus once Horus becomes War Master. So he's one of Horus's guys, and so he's got a frontline view to all the crazy shit that starts to go down. He's not just a grim, hulking dealer of grim, dark death. He's actually a very sweet, sensitive guy who starts off really naive, but he is kind of driven to question things because he's had some philosophical training. He actually kind of likes thinking about stuff and not just fighting, and he grows and changes over the course of several books that he's in, especially in this first one, and it's really cool to watch him have a dynamic character arc right there. That's a sign that, no, these books aren't gonna suck. Then the other point of view characters you have are Remembrancers, and this was such a great fucking idea. Mad props to whoever came up with this. So Remembrancers are artists and documentarists, and they are assigned to each of the legions by the Emperor, so they mostly come from Terra, and their whole point is to make art about the Great Crusade, so that thousands of years later people will remember it, because it's gonna be this great amazing thing that brings the whole galaxy together under humanity's rule. It's gonna be so awesome. Why wouldn't we want to remember it? The Remembrancers are all just people. Just the regular human point of view dealing with your seven foot tall space marines and your ten foot tall fucking primarchs. That was such a great idea. A lot of them are also very dynamic characters. They all have their own arcs too. I think that is why these books managed to succeed, or at least this first one does. I'm reading other ones and I'll do reviews of those too, but this first book was really important, right? Because you got to kick off this whole series. Abnett does a really good job with Horus himself at showing what he was like in the beginning, where he's like, I'm a father to my men, but I also want to protect civilians, and I actually try to negotiate with aliens rather than just automatically fucking killing all of them. You also, though, get to see the very first beginnings of doubt. What happens is Horus is just consumed by his insecurities. One of his brethren Primarchs, who I hadn't mentioned, Lorgar, he has the word lore in his name, and his legion is the word bearers. <laughs> Lorgar, by the beginning of the Horus Heresy, has already gone down the path of chaos because he was obsessed with his father in a religious way and started building temples to the emperor, planets that he'd conquered, and his dad basically gives him a bitch slap and is like, no, I'm not a god. You're not allowed to worship me. You're a very naughty boy. And whacked him on the nose with a rolled up newspaper. Lorgar just could not freaking handle this. He just can't take rejection, and to be fair, the Emperor was a big dick about it. Lorgar went and sought out the forces of chaos. After he and all of his marines have become corrupted by chaos, he sends his chief agent to go whisper into Horus's ear. Actually blending two cream blushes to hopefully get the effect that I want. Normally I just lay one down on top of another, but we'll see how this goes. To get the effect of a tragedy, we have to have a tragic hero, and Horus is that tragic hero. Abnett definitely does a good job at getting us to see this dude who becomes the ultimate villain of the galaxy when he was just a nice, normal guy. And I mean, he really was a nice guy. He was encouraging his space marines to develop hobbies and shit because at some point the war was supposed to be over, right? And they were gonna need to have shit that they could do afterwards. I do love the idea of space marines trying to do regular shit after the war. The space marines have this drive for glory, everything in the name of the emperor, and they're all mostly glory hounds, especially when they're fighting, and they all want to be the one who gets the big victory and stuff. So what happens when they have to turn their swords into plowshares? <laughs> they're gonna be like, I shall grow the largest pumpkin the Empire has ever seen! Glory to my pumpkins! Horus is actually trying to plan for the future. That all does not fucking pan out, but we already knew that. 
Another great thing about these books is the prose. The writing is actually not shit. Abnet knows his way around a phrase. The fighting scenes are actually pretty engaging. And despite the fact that, again, you know how these books are gonna go, well, you don't know how all of the characters that aren't the Primarchs, you don't know what's gonna happen to them, so you really don't know who might die and who might not. The stuff involving the forces of chaos, because they get kind of introduced in the book, is genuinely fucking spooky. You also find out that the Emperor, in his quote-unquote wisdom, i.e. his terrible parenting, <laughs> has not adequately prepared any of his forces for dealing with chaos. The Primarchs know, because they're all very powerful psychics, using psychic powers draws on the energies of the warp, and it's one of those if you can see them, they can see you kind of thing, so evil warp entities might come and seize upon you. Aside from very basic knowledge that sometimes the warp can have bad effects on people, none of the space marines know anything about chaos, and they don't even know that that's what it's called. They are taught that there's no such thing as gods. There actually are, you know, fucking chaos gods, and the Emperor didn't tell the Primarchs about that part either. The Primarchs know there's such a thing as chaos, but they're taught that it's just warp energy, so this is terrible. He's such a bad dad. There's a lot of fan speculation about maybe the Emperor was secretly playing 25th dimensional chess because how else can you explain his terrible, terrible, terrible decisions? And I would say, well, it's easy. He was a brilliant psychic and genetic engineer and military strategist, but he just doesn't know how people work at all. And he is, again, an absolute shit parent. So what happens in this book is basically just an introduction. You get to meet Horus, you get to meet some of the marines that work with him. They're mostly captains of smaller companies within the legion of the Luna Wolves, who then become the Sons of Horus. In the grim darkness of the far future, they're actually called the Black Legion, so they've undergone three name changes. You get to meet them, and you see how they are waging war. They get into a couple of really tight scrapes. You get to also interact with some of the other legions. They have to show up to help the Blood Angels run by ultimate sexy Bashonan angel vampire Sanguinius. The Blood Angels themselves are also vampires. They have a thing called the Red Thirst, which means they need blood, but they keep it secret, so we're not supposed to know about that shit. We also see Horus just dealing with his brothers. He's the one who's holding all of this shit together. There is a lot of fucking pressure on him, and again, his father will stop loving him if he fucks anything up. And what happens is he starts to crumble under the pressure. He starts to be like, if my father trusted me with being the War Master, why couldn't he trust me with the secret of what he's doing back on the Earth? Why wouldn't he tell me that? Because with this kind of story, you need a slow burn. It can't all happen at once. Do you want the Star Wars prequels? This is how we get the Star Wars prequels, where basically Anakin goes from, oh, kind of okay dude, to someone who's okay with committing genocide, to I'm now the Servant of Darkness. You really wouldn't want that for these books. Especially not since there's 55 of them. I mean, what are they gonna be about? So you don't get any big historical events that we already knew about. They're going to a place where apparently shit is about to get real, and Horace's doubts are gonna really come back to plague him. Oh, by the way, these books pass the fucking Bechdel test. <laughs> There's two named female characters, and they actually talk to each other about shit. I was like, wait, what? Because, of course, one of the things I'd heard about Warhammer is that there's no women in it, which is not entirely true. All the Space Marines are all male. Because the Space Marines are based off of Primarch DNA, which is based off of the Emperors, in order for the transformations to take hold, you have to have a Y chromosome. Otherwise, you'll just die. Like, apparently, the Emperor did try creating female Space Marines at one point. There are kind of a female version of Space Marines in the future. Future, but right now there aren't any. What's interesting is that one of the Remembrancer characters, Mercedes, is clearly in love with Garviel Loken, but he is just totally fucking oblivious. So that's another thing with Space Marines. When I first heard about them, I'm like, so do their dicks work? Because I'm a perverted monster. Same thing about the Primarchs. Yeah, I mean, I know they're 10 feet tall, but do they fuck? And the answer is apparently no, at least not in this point in the books. They're just so focused on making war for the cause of the Emperor that they don't really have time to think about their dicks. Although, I mean, they did apparently go through puberty, so what must that have been like when you're, you know, 10 feet tall? <laughs> They're poor parents. And in the future, the Space Marines are warrior monks, and venerating the Emperor is supposed to take up any time that isn't spent training for war or fighting in war. Although, they must have the capacity to have their dicks work. When you're making a character, you can choose to have them quote-unquote chem-gelded. I guess they're chemically castrated so that they can't be seduced. They have the capability. But if you want any filthy Space Marine sex scenes, you're going to have to do like I did and go seek out fanfiction. <laughs> I'm a monster. 
you get a sense of the camaraderie that exists amongst the Space Marines, which makes you preemptively sad for how horribly it's all going to go. Because, of course, even when the Primarchs fall, not all of their legions succumb to chaos, which means you have a kind of civil war, which definitely happens in later books. And it is just really cool that some of the heroes of these stories are poets and photographers. War journalists, basically. I think that's a really cool touch. I didn't think it was too long, I didn't think it was too short. I wish there had been more filthy space marine sex, but that's personal preference. I really like it that Abnett does not shy away from the homoeroticism, which would naturally exist in the armed forces literally just consisting of men with male commanders. Primarchs are generally described as being incredibly good-looking, like beautiful, and all the space marines are always thinking of each other as incredibly beautiful men. I like that! I like that it's in there! Unfortunately, there's no actual homosexuality, but there's also not much in the way of any kind of sexuality, at least not at this point. Some of the legions do fall to the forces of Slanesh, the chaos sex monster, so... So yeah, as long as you go into these books kind of understanding what they are and what they're doing, this first one, at least, is a great introduction to the universe in general of the game, but it's also just fun as a book. I could see people enjoying this even if you're not super into the lore. I am totally into the lore now, by the way. I'm fucking obsessed with this shit. It's so much fun. Fun because it's so silly, but I love it. I hope I've managed to convey kind of why that is. I've already read a couple of the other books. I decided I want to actually review as much of this series as I possibly can. Don't worry, I will be spacing it out. We're going to continue with the Horus Heresy and see the winning streak holds. Obviously not for the Empire. So this is the final look. I do hope you like my dark springtime. The next video I do is going to be the all spoilers all the time version of my review for the Broken Earth books. So don't worry, I, I've had requests for that. Actual requests from people who view my channel. Ah, I'm excited, it's the first time. I'll get that out as soon as I can and then more Horus Heresy goodness. <laughs> This has been a lot of fun, and I'm looking forward to inducting even more people into the lore of the grim darkness of the far future. So until next time, bye y'all! <laughs>